Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. I'm Suzanne Buffum. I'm a poet in the creative writing program here at the University of Chicago. And it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Pearl Andelson Sherry Memorial Poetry Reading. Thanks to a generous fund established in 1997 by the Sherry family to honor the life and work of former University of Chicago student Pearl Andelson Sherry. This event has been our keynote poetry event for the past two decades, featuring in recent years such major contemporary poets as Anne Carson, Cecilia Vicuña, Fred Moten, Lynn Hajinian, and Mark Strand, among many others. This year, we're delighted to welcome Ilya Kaminsky to this growing list of luminaries. And we couldn't be happier that he's agreed not only to read for us, but to converse afterwards with my friend and colleague, the poet, translator, and scholar. And as I learned earlier today, Ilya's former high school and college classmate, Rachel Galvin, about whom I'll say a little more after the reading. Before I introduce Ilya, I should mention that uh, you as the audience, audience members are invited to type comments into the chat box throughout the event. And if you have questions, please type those into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, which Rachel will draw from if time permits at the end of their conversation. Born in 1977 in the city of Odessa, in what was then the Soviet Union and is now Ukraine, Ilya Kaminsky lost most of his hearing at the age of four when a case of the mumps was misdiagnosed as a common cold. Not until age 16, when his family was granted asylum in the United States, did he receive his first pair of hearing aids and re-enter the noisy stream of human speech. It's hard to imagine how those first boisterous American voices must have struck the young poet's ears, even then beginning to grow attuned to his own lyric voice, but it must have come as a relief from time to time to remove those intrusive apparati and slip back into the lush privacy of an attentive and discriminating mind. Kaminsky's long awaited new book takes up the theme of elective deafness in this case, on the part of a whole town, and stages it as an act of political resistance that reimagines disability as civil disobedience. If it's a protest poem, however, it's also a nuanced indictment of literary polemics. Lyric in its form and epic in its scope, Deaf Republic takes the form of a two act play complete with a dramatis personae and a chorus that calls to mind Greek tragedy, presenting us with a parable of state-sponsored violence and complacency that speaks as much to our present moment in American history as it does to the Soviet era abuses of Kaminsky's youth. As a work of moral inquiry, it's a sobering account of individual and collective complicity. As a work of art, it restores us by way of its vivid and astonishing particulars to the enduring joys, griefs, and intimacies of private life. Ilya's work as a law clerk for San Francisco Legal Aid and the National Immigration Law Center, and his pro bono work as a court-appointed advocate for orphaned children in Southern California, speaks to his ethics as a global citizen. The fact that he has translated, edited, and co-edited many more books than he has written himself attests to the kind of literary citizen he is. His generosity as a teacher, critic, collaborator, and anthologizer, not to mention his encyclopedic knowledge of world poetry and his boundless enthusiasm for the work of his contemporaries, make Kaminsky a global ambassador for poetry in our time. He joins us tonight from his home in Atlanta, where he holds the Bourne Chair in Poetry at Georgia Institute of Technology. To read about the many honors, awards, and distinctions he's received since his widely acclaimed first book, Dancing in Odessa, was published in 2004, you can click on a link in the chat. In the meantime, please join me in welcoming Ilya Kaminsky to the virtual stage. Thank you so, so much, Suzanne. I don't think I can live up to this generous introduction. So I'm just going to click my computer off and go sleep. 
Um, but thank you truly uh, for your very, very kind words and for your own thoughts, of course. And I also want to thank Stacha and Jesse and Marie for making this possible. Um, a, a lot of work went into this presentation and their part, and I'm very grateful. And of course, it's an honor and joy to speak with Rachel, who has uh, helped a lot this very book to happen in, in the first place. Thank you, Rachel. Um, having said that, if you don't mind, I'm just going to read some poems. I hope you guys are able to follow me. Um, I speak with a pretty heavy Russian accent, so usually I press the handouts. Uh, so in front of you, you will see the electronic version of a handout, that way you won't need to worry about my accent. I'm going to read approximately three poems, two very short at the beginning and the end, and then a longer piece, which is um, mostly the story of the Republic. The first piece is called, We Live It Happily During the War. We live it happily during the war. And when they bombed other people's houses, we protested, but not enough. We opposed them, but not enough. I was in my bed, and on my bed, and there the car was falling. Invisible house by invisible house by invisible house. I took a chair outside and watched the sun in a six month of a disastrous rain in a house of money, in a street of money, in a city of money, in a country of money, our great country of money. We for the us, we did happily during the war. Um, what follows is the story of the Republic, more or less. Um, it's a story of a pregnant woman and her husband um, in the middle of civic crisis. They see the policeman, a soldier, shoot and kill a young deaf boy. And in response to that murder, the whole town begins to protest by resisting to hear the authorities. That Republic, gunshot. Our country is a stage when soldiers march into town, public assemblies are officially prohibited, but today, Neighbors flock to the piano music from Sonia and Alfonso's puppet show. In Central Square, some of us have climbed up in the trees. Others hide behind benches and telegraph poles. When Petya, the deaf boy in the front row, sneezes, the surgeon puppet collapses, shrieking. He stands up again, snort, shake his fist at the laughing audience. The army gypsy works into the square, disgorging and so on, surge and disperse immediately. Disperse immediately. The puppet mimics in a wooden falsetto. Everyone freezes except Petya, who keeps giggling. Someone claps a hand over his mouth, the surgeon turns towards the boy, raising his finger. You! You! The puppet raises the finger. Sonia watches her puppet. The puppet watches this surgeon. This surgeon watches Sonia and Alfonso. But the rest of us watch Petty Lim back gather all the speed in his throat and launch it at the surgeon. The sound we do not hear lift the gals. Of the border. A soldier's march, Alfonso, covers the boy's face with a newspaper. Voting people, most of us trenches, watch so new by Petya shot in the middle of the street. 
she picks up his pack, tackle shining like two coins, balances them on his nose, observes this moment, how it convulses. Snow falls and the dogs run into the streets like medics. Fourteen of us watch. So the kisses his forehead, her shadow hole torn in the sky. It shimmers apart the bench, it's porchless. We see in Sonia's open mouth the nakedness of the whole nation. She stretches out. Besides a little snowman up in the middle of the street, as picking up its pallet, the country runs. Alfonso, in snow, you're alive. I wish for to myself there for something and you live. Something around down the streets falls, fails to get up. I run, etc., with my legs and my hands behind my, my pregnant wife, etc., down the Vasenka Street. I run, etc. It only takes a few minutes, etc., to make a man. Daphnis. An insurgency begins. Our country woke up next morning and refused to hear soldiers. In the name of Petya, we refuse. At 6 a.m., when soldiers compliment girls in the alleyway, the girls slide by, pointing to their ears. At 8, the bakery door is shut, and soldiers say, Vana face, though he is their best customer. At 10, Mama Gala chalks, no one hears you. At the gates of the soldiers' barracks, by 11 a.m., arrest begins. Our hero does not weaken, but something silent in us trenches. After curfew, Families of the arrested Han homemade puppets out of their windows. The streets empty, but for the squeaks of drinks and the tap tap against the buildings of wooden fists, empty in the ears of the town. Snow falls. Alfonso stands, answerable. My people, you were really something fucking fun. On the morning of the first arrest, our men, once frightened and bound to their beds, now stand up like human masks. The fist passes through us like a police whistle. Here as I testify, each of us comes home, shut in a wall at a stove at the refrigerator of himself. Forgive me. I was untanished with you, life to you. I stand answerable. I ran at Saturday with my legs and my hands at Saturday. I ran down the marks and cast read at Whoever listens, sent you for the father on my tongue, sent you for our argument that ends. Sent you for darkness, love, touch, fire. From a match, you never live. That map of form and no penny bars. I watch it's a certain thing that that boy that carried and fire in his mouth, his face and the asphalt, that map of bone and open it valves. It is the air, something in the air wants us too much. The earth is still. 
that our guard sit to cumber sandwiches. This first day, soldiers examine the ears of bartenders, accountants, soldiers, the wicked then fell in dust to soldiers. They tell Goras wife from her bed like a door of a bus. Observes this moment how it convulses. The body of the boy lies on the asphalt like a paper. The body of the boy lies on the asphalt like the body of a boy. I touch the walls, feel the pulse of the house. And I stare off wordless and do not know why I am alive. Be it tough, they see you, Sonia, and die between theaters and gardens and wrought iron gates. Be courageous, we say, but no one is courageous at the sound we do not hear. Lift the bells of the world. Before the boy, we made a child. Before the boy, we made a child. I kissed a woman whose freckles I rose in amazement. She had a mole on her shoulder which she displayed like a medal for bravery. Her trembling lips man come to bed, her hair. Water falling in the middle of the conversation meant come to pass. I woke in my barber shop of thoughts, yes. I see her love to bed on the chair of my hairy arms, but parted lips meant bite by parted lips lying under the cool sheets, Sonia. The things we did. Soldiers say at us. Soldiers say at us. They fire at the crowd of women fleece inside the nostrils of search lights. My God, have a photograph of this. In the piazza's bright air, soldiers direct Peter's body and his head bang the stairs. I feel through my wife short the shape of our child. So dear drag Peter up the stairs and homeless dug the us philosopher to understand everything and bark and bark. I now on a bridge with no camouflage of speech, a body wrapping the body of my pregnant wife tonight. We don't die. I don't die. The earth is still a helicopter. I both my wife and I, a man, cannot flip a finger at the sky because each man is already a finger flipped at the sky. Lullaby, lullaby, sleeping soldier. Rainbow, snow, and branches protect you. White wash it walls and neighbor's hands, oh, child of my airplanes. Little earth of six pounds. My white hair keeps you asleep. Lit. While the child sleeps, Sonia undresses. She scraps me until I spit soapy boat of pig. She smiles. A man should smell better than his country. Such is the sounds of a woman who speaks again, silence, knowing that silence is what moves us to speak. 
with my shoes and glasses in the air. I'm a deaf people and I have no country but a best up and an infant and a marriage bed. So together, that's sacred to us, washing each other's shoulders. Anyone, but with whom can you see it in water? Oh, yeah, bombardment. My body runs in our loom of street. My clothes is in a pillowcase. I look for a man who looks exactly like me to give him my son, yeah, my name, my shirt. It has begun. Neighbors climb the trolleys at the fish market, break it all their moments in half. Trolleys bark like intestines in the sun. Pavel shots, I am so fucking beautiful, I cannot stand it. Two boys still holding tomato sandwiches, happen at early slide. Soldiers say, but their face is the ears. I can't find my wife. Where is my pregnant wife? I, a body, an adult male, a waist to explode like a hand grenade. It has begun. I see the blue canary of my country, pick breadcrumbs from each citizen size, pick breadcrumbs from my neighbor's hair. The snow leaves the earth and falls straight up as it should. To have a country, so important. To run into boats, into street lights, into loved ones as one. Shoot. The blue canary, yes, my country, runs into walls, into street lights, into love, and one the blue canary, yes, my country, watches the legs as I run and fall. I see God. Watch. Vasenka citizen. Do not turn. They are evidence of happiness. In a time of war, each is a written part document. Of laughter, watch God, does have something to tell that not even they can hear. Love roof in the center square of this bumped out city, you will see one neighbor zips a cigarette, another gives a dog a pint of sunlit beer. You will find me, God, like a damn pigeon's beak. I am packing every which way. Uh, astonishment. Fire squad. I'm balconies, sunrise. And poplar sunlight and our leaves. Today, no one is shooting. A girl cuts her hair with the maiden and scissors. The scissors and sunlight. Her hair and sunlight. Another girl nicks a pair of shoes from a slipping soldier's covered with light. A soldier's way. And gave a task. Gave them. At night, what do they see? Tonight, she shot 50 women at Lerner Street. I sit down to write and tell you what I know. A child learns the world by putting it in her mouth. A girl becomes a woman and a woman earned body. They blame you for all things. And they in the body, what does not live in the body? The townspeople watch and take Alfonso. Now, 
each of us is a witness to us and to watch us, us, watch for service, draw our forms of our beings to the other side of us, fill up them all of us, cowards, if we don't say, we carry in our suitcase, our coat pockets, our nostrils, across the streets, they watch him with fire hoses. First he screams, then he stops so much sunlight. A t-shirt falls off a closet line, and an old man stops, picks it up, presses it to his face. Neighbors line up to watch him drown on the sidewalk like a body will lock. Ta-da! In so much sunlight, each of us is a witness stand. They take Alfonso and no one stands up. Our silence Okay, um, this is the last poem, and if we bring it a little bit closer home, okay? It's called In a Time of Peace. In a Time of Peace. In a habit, I worked for 40 something years. I once found myself in a peaceful country. I watched the neighbors open their phones to watch a cop demanding a man driver license. When a man reaches for his wallet, the cop shoots into the car window. Shoots. It is a peaceful country. We packed our phones and go to the dentist to pick up the children from school to buy shampoo and basil hours in the country in which a boy shot by police lies on the pavement for hours with him. In his open mind, the nakedness of the whole nation. We watch, watch others, watch. The body of a boy lies on the pavement exactly like the body of a boy. It is a peaceful country and it clips our feet in the bodies effortlessly. The way the president's wife trims her toy on us, all of us still have to do the hard work of dentist appointments of remembering to make a summer sale and basil, tomatoes, it's a joy, tomatoes and a little salt. This is a time of peace. I don't hear gunshots, but watch birds splash over the backyards of the suburbs. How bright is the sky as the avenue spins on its axis? How bright is the sky? Forgive me, but how bright is the sky? Um, thank you so much, Ilya, for that beautiful performance. Um, it was really great to have a text to follow alongside the, the, the performance and hear how much the human voice can transform what already feels so urgent and alive on the page. I really look forward to hearing uh, you speak about that question and the role of visual material in the book too on tomorrow's image, sound and text panel. Um, before I hand the mic over to my colleague, Rachel Galvin, who I think is currently on the screen, um, a few words of introduction may be in order. Like many of my colleagues in the English department, and like Ilya himself, Rachel wears many hats. She's the author of two collections and several chapbooks of poetry. She's also an award-winning translator. And perhaps most relevant to tonight's conversation, she's the author of a scholarly account of how civilian poets since the Spanish Civil War 
have confronted the ever urgent problem of writing about war. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Rachel. I'm so excited to hear the two of you speak and we'll now pass the mic over to you. Thank you, Suzanne. And thank you, Ilya, so much for this incredible reading. I'm still reeling from it. It's a huge pleasure and an honor and a delight uh, to hear you read your poems and to have this chance to talk about them. You know you're one of my all-time favorite poets and your work has meant mm. more to me than I can even begin to say here right now. Um, I, I know we were just reminiscing about how many decades now it's been that we've been sharing poems. Um, and this new book that we've just heard from is so astonishingly powerful. It's spellbinding. Um, it's timeless. Uh, and timely at the same time and woven from deeply memorable imagery and lines that echo in my ears full of anger and love and humor and wonder. And it's such a joy to hear you read from it live. Um, of course, I wish we were in person this evening and that we could all be together in one room to share energy and feel the reverberation of your poems. But one upside of this virtual format is that we have people attending from all over tonight who might not otherwise be here. So I just want to echo Suzanne's uh, words of warm welcome to everyone who's here and who's taken the time to tune in and, and be with us. Um, and also thank you again to Jesse and Starsha and um, Suzanne who orchestrated this whole festival um, and to Marie who's providing captions. So as Ilya and I begin to have a conversation, I want to invite members of the audience to put any questions that you have into the Q&A. Uh, so we have the chat on the one hand and then the Q&A for questions. And if we have some time, we'll try to take some of them. Um, so Ilya, I thought I would start by asking you about the somewhat unusual structure of the book. Um, we might call Deaf Republic a play in verse in some senses. Um, we have characters and the townspeople who are something of a chorus, and then it's organized into two acts. Um, but when the poems appear on the page, as we just saw, they look like poems um, and not uh, a play. Um, so I wanted to ask you about some of the challenges or surprises that you might have encountered as you put the book together um, and formed it into a coherent whole. Um, and balancing between plot on the one hand and lyricism on the other. Thank you and thank you Rachel for your friendship for many, many years and for your poetry, which I was lucky enough to read and uh, also for helping this book happen. You read many, many different versions. So you already know the answer to your question. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I, I will try to do my best. My usual response to it, I probably will repeat my, myself by saying it again at some point, is um, writing a um, story in verse, I realized that it's a little bit like beating your head against the wall and hoping that um, the wall will break and not your head. Um, because those are really two competing impulses, the lyric and the narrative impulse. And, um, I thought going in that I was a narrative poet and I realized it coming out that I'm really not a narrative poet. Um, but that was something I had to find out for myself. I think um, in some ways as writers, we don't really write in English or Russian or French or Spanish or Chinese and so forth. We write in the language of poetic devices. So when we think of say, I don't know, Walt Whitman, he wrote in the language of anaphora, of course, most, most people will tell you. But also if you close the anaphora, we see the unending, beautiful, complicated, inventive sentence. And that sentence is made also inventive by um, alliteration and assonance, or very strange images like the earth of slumbering and liquid trees. Or when we think, I don't know, Emily Dickinson, you know, when you say with me, of course, you have to, you have to say Dickinson. So how, um, what is she writing? And most people would say, of course, dashes, right? Well, yeah, sure. But what do we really want to say is syntax. 
And uh, then, of course, the question would be, oh, you know, the stupid response would be the Chesetho points to the yellow star of Texas, which is really, because she's actually quite more worried than people give her credit for in her syntax. Um, but you also notice that even though she gives you the expectation of Ryan, she often denies that expectation. And she denies when she wants you to stop. And another thing that is fascinating to me about Dickinson is that she's truly a kind of a first American surrealist. Um, you know, I mean, way before Britain, we had the world has studio loaded gun, a hope that the has feathers, and so much more. Um, so she's thinking of those devices. But when, um, and then you see, I'm trying to avoid your question, of course. Uh, but it's a long way of saying for me is that coming from a somewhat different background, I obviously come from former USSR, uh, Soviet Jew, um, even uh, in Ukraine, um, which is now an independent country. Uh, coming from that background, the coin of the realm, so, so to speak, was fabulous. Mm -hmm. Isaac, so we see it all the way to Isaac Babel. You wouldn't call Isaac Babel a documentarian, even though she actually went to war and worried about that for. It is mm -hmm. all a, fa a fable, a fabulism, a kind of a dream which rings true. Um, mm -hmm. And that was very much something that I felt native to me. Uh, mm -hmm. when you, you, you can see a lot of that echo in a different way in my first book. Uh, that's mm -hmm. yes, my first book was in some ways written in the language of images, far more than in English or in Russian. I didn't have hearing gates um, in USSR at all. So I realized that years later, I didn't think of it when I was writing those poems at the young kid in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I realized that later that I was really trying to keep talking in that language of images. And what does that mean? When you are mostly lip reading, when you can hear, when you don't have hearing aids, um, you watch the sentence on the mouth of someone, uh, but you also watch a bird in a pot of pecking at something. You also watch somebody on the balcony putting their laundry on. You watch somebody across the street sitting on the porch reading a newspaper, then not liking it because it is so with newspaper thrown in the way, then picking it up again and deciding to read it again. And all of that is a part of a sentence. Mm -hmm. All of that is told in the language of images. Now, the book was very much a conversation with Russian mostly Russian, but or Eastern European writers. That's what Nancy Inadjassa was. I finished it when I already lived in America for 11 years. And I had to ask myself, okay, what am I going to do next? Am I going to continue playing the Russian and keep <laughs> talking to this Russian poet? Well, I'm not that person anymore. I have lived mm -hmm. here for 11 years. And at that time, I moved to San Diego, California, which calls itself um, America's finest city, uh, or sometimes America's happiest city. And one of the first things you do when you move to another city is you go to Home Depot. And what do you <laughs> see in Home Depot in San Diego? You see a bunch of people who are trying to get a job to feed their families being dragged into a nice car because they don't have a particular piece of paper that's apparently required. Now, that is something that we see on TV these days. Uh, it is not something that was on TV 15 years ago, but it was very much in the streets of San Diego. At that same time, Ukraine, where I come from, was invaded by Russia. Part of Ukraine is still occupied. So all of those things are in my head when I'm trying to answer your question. Why? Because um, you can't, as a refugee, just come to another place and say, okay, now I'm gonna be an American poet, I'm gonna be writing like an American poet. Mm -hmm. um, your childhood is a big part of who you are, whether you like it mm -hmm. or not. And so what you need, and I'm just speaking for myself, of course, is to find a form that could speak for both of those experiences for a person with one foot and more than one place. And that is not a literary ambition to create a new form because I can. That is silly. 
Okay, it, it got to be urgent, it got to be necessary, humanly necessary. Um, hmm. And that is where hybrid form comes to my mind. And I'm stealing this from my wife, who is also a writer, Kate Kufaris. Um, she came up with this much better way to say it in a much shorter time, time span. Um, she believes, and I agree, so I'm quoting it, is that we create hybrid forms because the experience that we are trying to convey cannot be conveyed through already received forms. So a new form must be made for this kind of experience. And I would argue that any refugee experience in one way or another would require a hybrid form. And in, frankly, any lyric poet with the name would probably be reinventing form in one way or another. Even if you're a super traditionalist, like, I don't know, Tom Gunn, who would say, every sonnet is a plot against the sonnet. So there is hybrid right there already at the core of it. Mm -hmm. But I felt like I had to go further and do something with this fabulous idea that would mm -hmm. work both for the Ukrainian Soviet Jew who speaks Russian and someone who lives in San Diego and is writing this book right now in the United States. I hope this answers your question. Yes, it does. and. Um... There's a lot I want to pick up on that, and I'm, I'm thinking about um, how important uh, poetry of witness has been to you. Um, and in some ways, this book could be said to bear witness to what happens in Basenka, but Basenka is an invented place, um, maybe similar to Odessa, where you're, which is your native city, or maybe not. Um, it could be many places around the world where power is wielding military violence. Um, and creating the suffering and at the expense of human rights. Um, and that's one of the strengths of the book that it can be read in relation to many contexts. Um, can you talk about why you set those poems in an imaginary or maybe not so imaginary city? Maybe it's related to some of the comments you just made. Um, it is absolutely related simply because if I'm writing just about the United States, I'm denying the first 16 years of my life. What kind of honesty am I giving you if I'm denying everything I knew before, a new language even, and that is the first year and a half? Okay. Um, but there is a lot more to unpack. It's a very complicated question you asked. Number one, I would never dare to call myself a poet of witness. No way and how. I mean, Paul Celan is a poet of witness. Shetlav Miyosh is a poet of witness. Those are grand figures. Um, mm -hmm. I would never consider myself in that kind of sentence. Um, number two, I think, especially today in the United States, um, a lot of people misunderstand what we mean when we say poetry of Indian. There's a theory of Indian. There's more than one for sure. The mm -hmm. Indian, what does it mean? The basic misunderstanding is oh, it's like a witness in the courtroom. You know, I saw something and here I'm reporting. That is not at all yeah. what for so many serious sports who, put this, who stake their life on it witness means. Let me just, I don't have time to kind of to talk about all 50 of them, but let's just say two. Uh, probably the most famous in American context. Uh, what do we have? We have a famous anthology by Carolyn Forcher, a great anthology, great book, uh, called Poetry of Witness, 20th Century Poetry of Witness Against Forgetting, it's called. Now, in mm -hmm. that anthology, in the introduction, Forcher speaks very specifically that her definition has to do with writing out of condition of extremity. Mm -hmm. That is the frame. Not outside yep. of it, not just watching and then, you know, go to the beach and eating a sandwich. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. It's out of condition of extremity. Now, the other famous example we have, um, it's just like New York. Um, the great book called um, Witness of Poetry. And uh, it's a wonderful, very readable 
book where he talks what the most part pretty much about Polish poets after 1945, that generation. Mm -hmm. But um, to put it in a really quick way, I'll probably quote not me or but his friend at Bigley Herbert, who says that mm -hmm. for Herbert, um, poetry is like a barometer for its time. It doesn't tell us, it doesn't change the weather. It tells us what the weather is like. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So poetry witnesses us. It is not a poet who witnesses us, but poetry. A huge distinction, a huge ego yeah. is suddenly yeah. not in the room at all. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it's a grand claim for poetry. I'm not saying that I'm a poet of vision for one of those reasons mm -hmm. um, But it's uh, impossible for somebody like me coming from Eastern Europe and living in the United States, not to be thinking about it 24 seven. Um, you probably notice it in just what I read today, one word that repeats over and over and over is the word watch. And the science in the book, the science that repeats over and over is also watch. And watching is not necessarily a good thing in that town. Let's talk about that book. Who is the, the, who is the book about? Uh, the book has larger than life personalities, heroic, heroic personalities like Mama Gala or like Sonia and Alfonso. They stand up, they do something. Uh, and then there is town. Uh, an author speaks in the voice of the town. The town is a narrator of the book. Yeah. Not Mama Galia, not Sonia. Okay. And the town does terrible things. Town yeah. sees terrible things and does nothing. So for me, watching is a complicated thing. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. to pick up on that, you know, I wanted to ask you, because as you said, the poem is really woven through with fables and lullabies and dream sequences and but there's, it's bookended by two poems. We lived happily during the war and in a time of peace, which you finished with. And I wanted to ask you about those poems because they are slightly different from everything else in between. And the last poem, um, which you closed with makes reference to the murders of, um, uh, uh, of Philando Castile and, the, uh, and Michael Brown, um, although they're not named in the poem. Um, and I wondered if you could talk about um, why you chose to include, include those poems and position them there about these very kind of contemporary American issues um, surrounding a, a sort of fabulistic space um, and what they're saying about complacency and complicity. Um, if you could talk about, uh, talk about that a little bit. Thank you. That's a wonderful question, very important question for me. Um, and I was saying, the author of the book, the narrator of the book, the speaker, is not one of those wonderful larger than life characters. Um, the we that starts the book is also the we of the town. Uh, mm -hmm. The reader doesn't know it until the down of the book. The reader has this poem about the United States at the very beginning of the book. But they have this dream world of a Chagall-like town. Yeah. Um, and then they come back and they realize, oh, even some language in the final poem is repeated. Mm -hmm. And you realize that it's a dream, perhaps about us. Um, the book also had a lot of trouble with the word we. Um, we the people, who the hell are we the people? I mean, a, a bunch of very wealthy men knew the people who wrote the constitution and so forth and so on. It's just one of many, many examples. Um, it ends, the last line is me, not we. Even though the last line of the first poem is we. So that's also the journey of the book. Um, how, uh, as far as complicity goes, there is also the question of science in the book. 
what are science terms? And that probably also has to do with your first question about um, mm -hmm. hybrid. Why are science yeah. there at all? Um, I was a very ambitious boy when I was starting to write it, and I thought, oh, I'm going to have the whole poem in sign language. Well, that didn't happen. A lot. <laughs> I tried, I played. Um, but what I want you to do is I want you to show the town who begins with genuine desire to do the right thing, uh, and to honor that, and to show the language that they're trying to make, to avoid the authorities and to teach the reader that language as the reader went along. So if you look at the book, you will see that there is a sign and then there is a subtitle. And then sometimes the signs are repeated. It's just, just like in a textbook when you're learning a new language, the, the words are repeated, so you're learning them. But by the end of the book, there are no subtitles. And the reader already knows those signs, so the reader will already know what those signs signify. The reader has become a part of the community of the town because they possess the knowledge that another person who has not read the book would not have. Um, then of course, outside of all of that, there's the first sentence that you said when you asked your question. And it's slightly outside of the last sentence, but I, just to touch upon it. Uh, you said lullabies and so forth. Yeah. Um, I think it is probably important that's another uh, conversation with what I think is a false idea of witness. Uh, when we are told that we should witness the tragedy and 100% of what we say is tragedy, but what we get is a shock value. Yeah. You know, drama, yeah. drama, drama. That's not how real life works. In the middle of crisis, kids fall in love. People have children, their bodies, their parents, there was parents' bodies before they put them on the earth. Okay, there is a lot of human tenderness. Um, yeah. This book may be a fable, but it's very much based on the story of my family. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, my grandparents, uh, my grandfather was shot as enemy of the people in 1937. And my grandmother was sent to Siberia for 10 years. Um, my father was stolen. He is a stolen baby in the book. It actually did happen. He was brought to a different city. And in that city, another woman stayed with him, risking her life for four years of war in the city of Adyosa, which was occupied. How do you keep a young child in a room, not allow him to go outside for four years? So she was teaching him to tango. She was occupied, she was dancing tango with her. She was a middle-aged woman, a Russian woman, who saved the Jewish child. Um, so yes, of course, it's a fairy tale. Of course, I'm not quite telling this, this particular story, but all of it is connected. Um, how can it not be connected if, if it's a part of one person's life? Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, we have a couple questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, and I see one from my colleague, the wonderful poet Chiku Reddy. Um, and I'll read his question, which is, uh, you began this book long before anyone could imagine Donald Trump in the White House. And yet Deaf Republic feels in many ways like an uncanny allegory for the upsurge of fascism in this country over the last four years. How did your plans and intentions for Deaf Republic evolve and transform in response to the real time of American and world politics over the book's long formation? Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Chuka. Um, fascism in this country did not begin with Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump is a very bad illustration of fascism in this country. I mean, do I need to name Andrew Jackson? Do I need to name George Bush? I mean, we know all of that. Um, this is obvious. Um, everybody knows it. Now, the second part of the question, um, an allegory, I wasn't really trying to write an allegory. I was literally trying to answer, look, 
when a writer is writing a book, a writer doesn't sit down and say, I want to write an allegory. That never happens. A writer sits down and says, how do I live my life? What are my impossible questions? How can I speak both about the, fall, the falling apart of USSR and the America's happiest city? In the same poem. <laughs> Um, and it happens to be an allegory simply because that is the form that authors itself. Look, I was trying, um, there is um, another question just above, but it's really the same question yeah. um, about mm -hmm. the body of the boy laying on, on the street, right? Uh, like the body of the boy. And the person who had the question calls it a simile, which is interesting because it isn't a simile, is it? Um, that's another, one of those moments when the writer is confronted with craft because they're trying to answer an impossible question. Uh, when you are, when you have questions that you don't know how to answer, uh, like how to live, you come to your bookshelf and you ask, "Who's going to teach me?" Literally, and I don't put my books in alphabetical order. I don't believe in that. I put my <laughs> books by craft. So here are metaphors, here is music, here are images and so forth and so on. And um, because of the nature of how my life happened, images seem to be far closer to me. Meaning a half of the metaphor is already done. You can't really have much of a metaphor without an image. You have an attraction and you have an image and the baby is born called, called metaphor, right? Um, okay. It's, I realized that metaphors and similes would be easy and the book is full of them. But the most important stuff, the, mo the moments that I wanted people to pay attention to were the moments when I deny myself an immature metaphor. Which is why it doesn't say like blah, 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 something pretty, but like exactly what it is. The denial of craft. Mm -hmm. So we fall in love with a certain kind of poetry, but then we also have to break it in order to have some kind of self-understanding. But that has to happen in craft. And it happens on every single mm -hmm. level, other than usual level, like an allegory, um, a panorama, a narrative where you must have a crisis, where a character must change, that your character cannot change you, alas, kill your character, and, you know, you have a lot of depression mm -hmm. because you just killed your favorite character. It's not easy to kill Mama Gali, it was the hardest thing in the whole book. But mm -hmm. alas, uh, that's a part of uh, your, your struggling with your artist part, right? Mm -hmm. your, narrative person and your lyrical person have to come together. Um, mm -hmm. But again, trying to answer Chico's question, um, book has changed a lot over time. I published different versions of the book. Um, the poetry magazine online has about like 10, 10 or so poems which have characters that no longer exist. And um, I'm perfectly fine with that. That is okay. Yeah. What I was trying to do was um, I was trying to come up with an arc that would be true to what is happening in the United States and what I saw as a child. As a person, we all have some kind of compass. I definitely not moral compass because of so many other compasses, but moral compass too. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that compass leads our decisions in art. A lot of it happens by accident, sure. There's no art without surprise. But when that surprise <laughs> happened, you realize, oh, it was all meant to be that way. And so I had to cut bits from the books that felt too much like Ukraine or too much like the United States, because I am a divided person. I'm not a divided person by choice. Mm -hmm. It so happened in my life that I went into languages that I live in two countries. Okay. Mm -hmm. And both of those are radically different countries, which with every year seem to look very similar. And that is where we have the drama of Donald Trump and what the last five mm -hmm. years have done to our country. They're becoming more and more like Ukraine, which is a country that is very, very young and that have 
oligarchs to very, very rude and outrageous point. Mm -hmm. We used to have oligarchs always, but they were a little more invisible. Now they're way in our face. You know, I'm thinking about Miles' question about the the um, uh, the comparison or the the resistance to comparison, um, which of course Pablo Neruda uses in his Spanish Civil War poems um, from a period that I've spent a long time studying, where he says the blood runs in the street like blood running in the street, and there's a kind of series of non comparisons like that. Um, which I think, uh, in my reading, he's he's using for the very same reasons that you describe right now. Um, I see a point of connection there. Um, yeah. Yeah, but Neruda um, is writing a great lyric cycle, um, great lyric poem. Um, I was writing a fairy tale in verse. In order for <laughs> that to work on seventy pages as opposed to two pages or three pages. Um, it needs to be surrounded by something unlike it. So there is tension. The secret to everything, mm -hmm. to my knowledge, the secret to everything in art is tension. There got to be some kind of tension, not just anaphora in those women. You close the anaphora and you look at the rest of the sentence. You look at the sounds of the sentence, you have tension. Not just boom, boom, mm -hmm. boom, rhyme and Emily Dickinson, but denial mm -hmm. of rhyme also, mm -hmm. but syntax, but ideas, mm -hmm. incredible things, incredible things, yeah. but metaphors or similes, all those things in tension produce mm -hmm. art. I don't know how to make art without tension. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know if possible. Now, it doesn't mean that a, a poem cannot be a super quiet, nurturing poem. A lullaby, please, you get a lullaby. But in a lullaby, they got to be something that gives attention of tenderness. In that particular poem's mm -hmm. case, I had to go to Mother's Blues and look at this early tension in Ryan. How Ryan works to kind of weigh an emotion. Something got to kind of weigh something else. The art needs to do work. Very early on, I had really good luck to interview a great prose writer, Grace Bailey. Um, I was a kid. I was interviewing her together with a good friend of mine who was a novelist at that time. I wasn't published. Um, so I asked her a question, being a naive boy. I asked her, Grace, your stories, and she never wrote a novel, she only wrote short stories. So she, I said, in your stories, you have a character that reappears. The character's name is Fate. What is her function? She looks at me and she was amazing. She, she was already dying of cancer and she gave time to speak to a young boy about her characters. So she says, oh, Fate. Yeah, I remember her. She works for me. She's in my employment. <laughs> Meaning everything <laughs> works for you. Everything you do yeah. is in your employment. Whether it's a metaphor or a rhyme or an allegory, everything got to be there for a reason to drive it on, to give it life. Can I ask you one last question, kind of segueing from that, about the role of deafness? in the book, um, it's described in different ways throughout the poems. Um, sometimes it's a form of insurgency or resistance and other times it's a kind of indifference um, and it changes shape. Um, can you talk about this? This is kind of a crucial uh, crucial aspect of the whole book. Richard Gavin, you ask a 19 questions. It's, uh, it's gonna take a half hour to answer it. But I'm going to try to show it on it. Uh, thank you. Um, well, of course, it is something that is, um, how to put it, before um, the beginning of 20th century or late 19th century, poets used to write for muse. Uh, you know, oh, great muse, the poets say, it, speak to me, sing to me. Um, and then what happened in the late 19th century? Freud happened. He said, he told us, put schmucks, that we write out of our deepest obsessions. So deafness is obviously one of my obsessions. And moreover, the word silent is one of yes. my obsessions. So how yes. to unpack it? Every day you come to it, you try to assail it and assail it and assail it, beating your head against the wall, right? And hope that the wall will break. Um, so there's a lot to unpack here. Um, number one, deafness 
other word has many different meanings in the book and outside in our culture. The, the whole Daf culture, Daf with a capital D, with its own language, with its own customs and traditions. Now, sign language is not just ASL American sign language. You would win the, the same sign language all over the world. It would make sense, but no, that's not the case. Uh, Russian sign language is very different from French sign language or American and so on. Even British and American sign language are very, very different. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one way to unpack it. Another way, and that's here we go a little bit more to the question for a writer, the metaphysical question. It actually has to do with an actual, uh, then that happened to the scientists um, a good while ago now in the 80s, I believe, uh, when scientists put four hearing people who didn't speak each other's language in the same room, and lock at the door and left. I don't know for how long, for four hours. Say. When they come back, what happened? Four hearing people, say from Poland, France, Mexico, United States, just for the sake of, who did not speak each other's language, sat in four different corners of the room silently and looked at each other with quite a bit of suspicions. They did the same thing with four deaf people. What happened? They did not speak each other's language, but when they come back, the people were making up a new language. Then there is, of course, the question, what does it mean to us about limitations of language? Mm -hmm. Every single poet <coughs> can speak 24 seven about limitations of language. It's a part of our job description. What is poetry <laughs> of all Islam if not lecture for the rest of our lives? about the limitations of language. Or what is that great line from King Lear when the mad king is holding his dead daughter in his arms and he can't speak in proper grammar anymore. All he says is holding his daughter in his arms. Never, 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 never. So there's a lot of metaphysical dimension, mm -hmm. but that too is under question. How? Well, <clears throat> All of our philosophy, theology, um, speaks about silence in a very high style, the silence of God and all that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if 8% of people and 8% of people on this planet are either deaf or hard of hearing, do not have experience of silence the way our mainstream philosophy and theology tells us it should be experienced because the deaf, they can't hear silence. They don't know the difference, right? Mm -hmm. I asked every single poet who happens to be hard of hearing or deaf if they believe in silence, dozens of people. And every single person said, no, I do not believe in silence. What does it tell us about our zoology, our philosophy, our metaphysics? Right there, you <laughs> got a real tension a real limitation. Um, then we, we, talk, we talk about real life stuff. Like we are in the United States in the middle of pandemic. Um, the days are lot, I have to go to the hospital pretty often. Uh, everybody wears masks. I of course don't, don't understand. I have to read lips, I can't read lips. Yeah. So right there, there's a question of human rights, right? Um, <laughs> there's also the question of human rights in terms of um, health insurance. A huge chunk of our population doesn't have health insurance. We are in the middle of pandemic. Um, a great disability scholar, Rosemary Garland Thompson, writing in the 90s when I was an undergraduate, I read her book, Extraordinary Bodies, as the undergraduate. It's an introduction, she said, and I really stole that for my book. She said, the disabled body should move from the realm of the hospital room to the realm of political minority. Now she wrote that, what, almost 30 years ago. It's incredible, incredibly important for our country right now today. And she's a disability scholar, you know, a theorist. It is super important in the daily life of you and me. Um, so when we speak of silence, we speak of so many different things. It can be cultural, it can be metaphysical, it can be creative, it can be daily experience of all our neighbors in France. Uh, you know, in the book, I go back and forth because um, I have hearing aids. 
and I know the difference when you turn them off and on. So I can understand uh, what a mainstream hearing person would mean by silence. But I also have memories up to 16, 16 when I did not have that experience. And they're equally valid. Thank you. Uh, I think we could go on talking for another three or four or five hours um, and uh, keep everybody with us. <laughs> it's such a pleasure Come to speak to with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ilya, endless gratitude to you for reading and sharing your thoughts. This has just been extraordinary. And thank you again to Jesse and Starsha and Annette and to Suzanne for orchestrating this whole festival and to Marie for providing captions. And there's my puppy. He's waited till the very end to start barking. I'm sorry about that. Um, and thank you to everyone who's here, um, who's come to our virtual space to be with us tonight and to hear this totally uh, uh, I don't have an adjective. I don't have an adjective for Ilya for your poetry, the stupendous um, poetry. And we hope you will continue to stay with us and tune in over the next few days. We have a phenomenal roster of writers. Um, tomorrow, I'll tell you about two events. Um, at 12 o'clock, Ilya will be speaking um, about long form writing on a panel about craft, along with Kathy Park Hong, Julie Iramania, Stephanie Swallow, and Le uh, Lina Cabezavanegas, uh, moderated by Rachel DeWaskin. And then at 6 p.m., this is all central to standard time, uh, we have the, the illustrious Deadman Writer in Residence series where Ka Kathy Park Hong will give a reading and be in conversation with Sian Nye. And you can find all the links to register for this on the UChicago Creative Writing Eventbrite site. Um, so thank you again, and a big warm round of virtual applause <laughs> to Ilya. Um, thank you so much, and thank you everybody. We'll see you soon. <laughs>